Welcome everyone to another episode of We Are Being Transformed. This is a podcast that, contrary to popular rumor, is not a Transformers-oriented show. We do not do unboxings of Rodimus Prime here. We uh, discuss the myriad of ways in which people interact with and are changed by their culture, whether that be ritual, myth, lore, legend, or religion, for lack of a better term. And our guest today is a man who knows a thing or two about the Emperor Julian. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Swist, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. It's uh, been a busy week, but uh, I always uh, am happy to talk about Julian and his world. Yeah, it's kind of like me with uh, Lucian of Samosata. Like, there's there's never a time not to talk about Lucian, right? So, <laughs> true story. <laughs> this is, yeah, exactly. True story is awesome. Um, so we're going to talk about a figure who is very polarizing. Uh, strangely enough, also somebody who, while being used for this person or that person's personal agenda, we know very l little, like in terms of the general public about this person's life. We just, when we hear something like Julian the Emperor, or Julian the Apostate, we have a certain idea in our head that's created through, you know, church fathers, um, the accidents of transmission through history. So. If you could just kind of give us a little um, overview of who Julian was, then we can kind of get more into the um, the weeds with it, so to speak. You're right that you know Julian the Emperor or Julian the Apostate, uh, as I think he's being called less and less now because that is a derogatory term that Christianity Christian authors uh, did impose on him. Uh, he's not a household name, and you can say that's kind of a general thing with late antiquity, right? Uh, a lot of people are brought up, at least traditionally, on this idea that, you know, there was antiquity, then the Roman Empire fell, and then there were the Middle Ages, you know, starting with the so-called Dark Ages. And late antiquity is a, when people start learning about it, they're, they kind of realize, wait a minute, uh, history doesn't quite work that way. You don't just, you know, suddenly we're in the Middle Ages, right? Uh, this is a period of very gradual transition in which a lot of elements from the past, from, you know, Greco-Roman antiquity are coming into some sort of dialogue, fusion, conflict with some new ideas, new movements, um, new aesthetics that are kind of early versions of what you will see in the future, certainly by the Middle Ages. And of course, one of the main things is uh, various uh, types of Christianity and theology, which, you know, at that time was one of many similar uh, takes on religion uh, that existed at the time, including kind of the form of pagan Hellenic religion that Julian subscribed to. So, you know, when we talk about him as an apostate, uh, as he was called, you know, he was not necessarily just, you know, pulling a 180, you know, going to a different spiritual tradition that kind of offered a lot of similar answers uh, to him. And the thing about Julian is he saw that what these other cults had to offer him uh had grounding in precedent of of being a much older tradition and they were also compatible with uh the various types of platonic philosophy that he was studying and he did not see christianity as being able to be reconcilable uh with these uh with these other forms of religious and philosophical thought um so that's a kind of roundabout way to talk about well julian himself he was an interesting situation because, you know, if you think of one household figure from from late antiquity, uh, you think of the Emperor Constantine, you know, the guy who, because he, uh, he didn't convert the empire to Christianity overnight or make it the official religion, but mainly because he started favoring Christianity. Uh, and he reigned a long time, and his sons reigned a long time. By the time you get to the 350s, 360 uh, CE, which would be about half a century after Constantine had the vision of the Milvian Bridge and started favoring Christianity as the god who gives him victory and who will unite the empire. 
uh, Christianity really becomes the establishment religion for a lot of the political elites because that's the religion, the favored religion of the of the imperial court. Yet Constantine had a nephew named Julian who comes along and while he, you know, as he's kind of rising up through the ranks, so to speak, of his of his uh, imperial career, he is nominally a Christian and he but by the time he becomes sole emperor after various uh, fortuitous events, uh, he says, well, wait a minute, uh, Christianity is actually not, you know, the religion of the future here. It's a temporary aberration. Uh, you know, my uncle and my cousin, you know, at, that who ruled before me, they were misguided. And so I am going to basically reverse course here and return to the traditional uh, and so I am going to basically reverse course here and return to the traditional uh, civic cults of the empire. Uh, so I'm going to promote all of these traditions that people celebrate in their various cities and, and the country uh, founded in much uh, older precedent than Christianity, which he sees as a recent uh, innovation. In fact, he thinks of it as a sort of Jewish heresy. Uh, they started as Jews and then they developed this whole new theology where they essentially take this one guy and who died, but they believe he resurrected. And he says it himself that they worship corpses, right? They worship one man who died, one corpse, but they also worship the relics of saints uh, as having some sort of power. And so he refers to churches as, you know, ossuaries or charnel houses or tombs where people tend to worship these corpses, including the corpse of of uh, of the Galilean, as he calls them. And he calls them all Galileans in order to uh, refer to the origin of this religion in this kind of provincial backwater, Galilee, um, because his concept of religion at this time is very much classically based where a religion is not something that is revealed from above uh you know and a kind of a universal thing it is something that is very much particular to to specific places and specific peoples okay so the athenians have their civic cult of athena right and then the romans right they have their particular cults of jupiter and mars uh, and the Jews have their own kind of ethnic God who oversees them. And he did not think of that God as the universal God. He is just simply a God who is particular to that region. And so he kind of makes fun of the Galileans as Jesus is their God, even though he's not actually a God. Uh, also, from his study of philosophy, he sees this plurality of religions as also comprising a unity because all of these different gods, all these different traditions that uh, in all these different cities throughout the empire in forms of worship from a philosophical point of view uh, can all be reconciled. And because all of these gods in these traditions are essentially emanating from a supreme god. A, it's a kind of a, you won't, it's not monotheism, it's not pure polytheism, it's somewhere in between. You might call it henotheism is is one thing that might work here where, or a soft monotheism where right. ultimately it's all one God, but there are various uh, subordinate gods that emanate and, get, and receive their being from this higher God. And then these are the more particular gods who oversee these different parts of the empire. And so, so Julian, when he comes to power as emperor, he is kind of taking that theoretical framework and trying to put it into practice because he genuinely sees this as the way things used to be. Whereas Christianity was this religion that was essentially atheism to him because unlike all these other, this other plurality of religions where they accepted, you know, the fact that people worshiped other gods, the Christians believe these all these other gods were either fake or they were demons or they were just not gods, you know, in the sense of their god. 
and to Julian, he thought that that idea was tantamount to atheism, um, right. and it was also dangerous, right? One thing I really love about Julian as a figure, he uh, really comes up at a very volatile time in the history of the Roman Empire. The world is vastly different at the beginning of the fourth century compared to where it ends. This is kind of Western Civ one class, and it's just kind of like, well, this happened and there was polytheism, paganism, then Constantine, Milvian Bridge, yada, yada, then everything becomes Christian afterwards. But we, we when you dig a little bit deeper, uh, we tend to forget that things weren't always this set in stone. Like there was a volatile period of time where this could have gone any other way. And Julian was a great uh, example of this because he's coming up in a time, not only where these cults are established, this religion is, there's no other way many people can possibly think things could be. He's coming up at a time where you have things like Neoplatonism coming up and all these different uh, philosophies um, and they're taking uh, in this Christian stuff and they're kind of working their own little thing, right? You have the pagan holy man, as Garth mm -hmm. Fowden would say. So you have things like the Chaldean oracles and there's a huge re-emphasis in Paideia and in philosophy on the the pagan, the Hellene um, religions and things like that. So kind of like a reinforcement of identity. You have this kind of culture war going on in a sense. I just kind of talk a little bit about what the world that Julian inherited was like in terms of these thoughts and these um, kind of cultural things that are going on. You have like Neoplatonic Yamblichian theurgy, and then you have all this other side, uh, you know, all this Plat this more contemplative Platinian thought, and then you have wild things like what John Dillon would call the uh, the Platonic underworld, right? The mm. Platonic underground with like Chaldean oracles and Hermeticism, and it's just this really yeah. exciting time in terms of like culture and thought. So maybe mm. we could explore that a little bit. Yeah, a lot there, and, you know, I think one of the most ex important kind of explanatory mechanisms for why you have that kind of radical change or shift, at least in terms of kind of the religious landscape between the beginning of the third century, so the beginning of the fourth century and the end, is it, it has very much to do with continuity. So, as I mentioned, Constantine was in power, you know, for several decades, and so were his sons, certainly his son, Constantius II. Julian comes along, he only reigns for 18 months, and then all the emperors after him happen to be Christian, right? And so you get to a point where, when the religion of the emperor and the court, and, and the religion that the emperor favors, you know, is maintained and and things are maintained that way for a long time then people get used to it people start to re start to kind of acquiesce in the idea that this is this is the new normal right uh especially when it gets to the point where people who remembered what it was like before say constantine started favoring christianity are no longer alive um, so i think a good example is when the Emperor Augustus comes to power at the beginning of the empire, he reigns for over 40 years. And Tacitus mentions this at the beginning of the Annales, where he says, basically, so few people were around by the time Augustus dies who remembered the old Republic. Because of that, most people alive, when Augustus dies in his 70s, the world that they took to be normal was a world in which you had monarchy, essentially, right? And right. you also had relative peace and prosperity during that time, at least if you were, you know, a Roman within kind of the, the center of the empire. Uh, and so people were... There was there there was inertia. People just thought this is this is how things are, and so Tiberius succeeds, and then you know the whole idea of we can go back to the Republic never really really happens because nobody really knows what it's like to be under anything that isn't the emperors. And so shift back to the you know to the fourth century CE, and it's like that with kind of Christianity as the 
religion of the establishment, right? When Julian comes to power um, in three six at the end of three sixty one, right? It has been, as I mentioned, almost a little more long as long as Augustus had reigned, right? Since you last had um, when Christianity was not favored, and so Absolutely. when he basically says, "Okay, I'm restoring." Uh, the old ways, yes, you have some people, but they're very few who actually know what it's like for a non-Christian emperor to be emperor. Um, and what right. you have to rely on is basically, it's almost like he has to reconstruct what that world is based on literary sources and based on sort of kind of the evidence that's there in front of him he almost has to be like an historian rather than just consulting people being like how did how were things used to be how did things used to be right and uh so you know some people will say that julian came onto the scene too late it was already at that point the inertia had already set in uh, if julian had reigned for you know, much longer and had a successor, you know, who maintained his policies, regardless of what those policies were, they were just, were not Christian, you know, things could have been very different. And you even see something like with Julian's policies, like religious reforms are almost like he's taking the cue from the ecclesiastical structure he's seeing every mm -hmm. day, right around him. So in a way he's kind of like, he's almost like, um, like when I was younger, uh, I was a little bit after the goth scene I, I grew up in the 90s but i was really um influenced by a lot of like 80s like goth bands so like mm -hmm. i would look at the magazine the old magazines and the old books and i would kind of try to recreate that my own little myth you mm -hmm. know of that so i think julian's kind of doing something similar he's he's in vogue kind of neoplatonic theurgical holy men um but he's also like looking back at a past that maybe is kind of romanticized mm -hmm. um and he's just really kind of he's being like like i was kind of like a hipster with that goth stuff he's like he's kind of like doing that with like the pagan stuff so i love that use kind of your analogy here kind of with my with kind of my counterculture like i think here in the 2010s and now the 2020s uh you know there's a revival in the heavy metal scene of like old school 80s style right um yeah. and there's been a real renaissance of that and all a lot, the vast majority of people who are into it are people who were either too young or not born in the 80s. Um, but because they're listening to the bands and being influenced from the styles from the 80s, they're kind of bringing it all back versus, you know, the people who are actually part of the 80s, you know, golden age. A lot of them are still around and they're taking part in it, but uh, discontinuity of, of evolution. And so I, I kind of think of kind of Julian as someone who was not, as someone who was young and therefore not part of kind of the the pagan golden age, if you will, right? He's trying to bring it back basically based on what he has read about it, right? Um, right. Rather it's than what, having actually known what it was like. Cool mm -hmm. parts of romanticism versus like a genuine desire, I think, on his part to really interact with these rights and everything and he's mm -hmm. he's really being influenced so what was julian's relation to philosophy and religion mm -hmm. what was his paideia like what who who is he kind of who is he the stand for you know in the paide paideia sense right. like who is he going to be the hearer to and you mm -hmm. know the one he, he wants to be like who's the person he wants to be the hetairoi to the most like yeah. so you mentioned a few minutes ago kind of all the different things going on in this milieu of the mid fourth century. Um, and you mentioned the idea of a culture war. And, you know, while there were certainly tensions, there was certainly conflict at, you know, it's sort of a similar dynamic to what you might call the culture wars today, where uh, we have strident voices on the extremes that are controlling the discourse and sort of creating the idea that, you know, there's this clash of incompatible paradigms. Um, whereas the majority of people who are, you know, not, at least not participating or 
in that those extremes on either side of this discourse, right, are actually somewhere in the middle and they're, you know, they're, they're, they don't, they're not at war with each other, right? They don't have the sense of the same yeah. where we're, especially with historical documents yeah. and evidence, mm -hmm. we're not always seeing like the full picture of yes. what life was like for the everyday person. Yeah. And thankfully in the fourth century, you know, we don't just have the extreme views. We also have people who are in the elites who were, you know, who were, you know, politically and intellectually, you know, uh, very high up there who are also sort of in these more middle moderate positions. And so there were, ex there were radical pagans and there were radical Christians, you know, you had fire and brimstone bishops who, you know, like Gregory Nazianzus, John Chrysostom, and all of those who, you know, wanted to stamp out paganism and Judaism and kind of get everybody to be believing the same thing about the nature of Christ. And, you know, he thought that the vast majority of people in the empire, even if they were nominally Christian, you know, they were morally, you know, debauched people and all of that, all of that rhetoric that you still hear, you know, today, you know, but you also have radical pagans who, you know, were kind of on the other end. And Julian was actually a part of this more radical part, uh, kind of faction of pagans. I'll get to that in a moment. But the vast majority of people who were either Christian or non-Christian, they didn't necessarily define their whole identity in terms of their religious affiliation. Okay? So for a lot of people at, at all levels of society, even at the very top in the court, uh, you know, in the Roman Senate or the Constantinopolitan Senate, right? You had a mixture of pagans and Christians, okay? And what mattered to them was they had solidarity of class. They had solidarity of kind of, poli of politics. We were, were all Romans, okay? Before right. we're all pagans or Christians, right? Who's kind of economic, uh, you know, and class. The idea. Paideia and the, pi and, the pi and the paideia is is the other thing, right? We right. have a, we have a common culture based around this education system in rhetoric that uh, is fueled by this canon of classical literature. Okay, and even though this canon is by pagan non-Christian authors, the Christians are still engaged with it and working with it very much like people who are Christian today are classicists, right? Uh, or are reading and learning and engaging with classical text. Same idea. We have people like Themistius, right? Um, you know, he is kind of represents kind of this tall, he's like a tolerant pagan who is, you know, he see, he works with the Christian emperors to kind of create this environment in which everyone really, in which there's this, there's this harmony, right? Um, and you also have Christians, okay, who, you know, are not, churchmen who are not bishops right who are also and even emperors who are christian you know a lot of them in this century are they realize that in order to have political stability you have to work with people who don't share your religion because especially for people like constantine and constantius and valentinian and even theodosius right um right. even though they might you know pay lip service to kind of the extreme kind of christianity is you know, should it should be everybody's religion, there's still many pagans, right, are, you know, in the elite class, and they need these people to run the empire together, right? There needs to be a consensus. Right. It just brought up a thought, like, you know, with Constantine himself, he really exemplified that mo the majority of his reign. And, and really, I think a lot of people conflate what his, his sons later did, like Constance and uh, mm -hmm. Constantius the second, like they were very much like, we need to push this and this is what it needs to be. You know, uh, Constance is like favor favoring Christian uh, rhetorical teachers like pro Hiresius, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but Constantine himself, you know, like you were saying, he, he's very pragmatic. He's 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 got pl Platonist philosophers at his court, just yep. like he's got like the Christian bishop. So, so now let's talk about kind of what Julian comes up as now. He starts with, you know, traditional, you know, elite Greco-Roman education. You know, he grows up, grows up in the Greek East. And basically after he gets his ABCs, he's starting to read Homer, 
right? And they start with Homer and uh, kind of mythological literature, poetry, and then he moves on to studying other literature and also learning rhetoric, okay? Learning uh, compositional exercises, right? How to write a good argument, okay? How to, learning the various forms of uh, literary genres and especially oratory for various occasions and of course at this time you know epideictic or kind of panegyrical encomiastic oratory is is very much in vogue because they're under a monarchy and sort of that's how you have to kind of communicate with with uh that way um, he masters these styles um under various uh, teachers and rhetoricians in uh in asia minor uh, where he's where he's where he's growing up, but eventually, and he's also of course learning the Bible. He's learning Christian theology. You know, some of his tutors were Christian bishops, and so he became very well versed in that as well. Regardless of whether he really was a devout Christian at any point, there's a lot of debate over whether he was ever really Christian at all or he was just sort of nominally a Christian until he didn't have to be anymore. Okay, that's a question that, you know, is, <laughs> we can't, there, there isn't really a lot that we can say about it. Yeah, we um, can't either than, way. Because again, we don't, his earliest writings are from, you know, 355, you know, when he's already, uh, you know, in his, in his mid-20s. We don't know. But at some point, as he is studying rhetoric, um, he becomes more and more interested in philosophy. Um, natural because, especially the rhetoricians that he's hang that he's learning from, like Libanius, you know, Plato, Plato's dialogues are considered, you know, not just works of philosophy; they're also considered models of good prose literature, right? right. And if you ever read Plato's dialogues, you can see that this isn't just a philosophical treatise. This is a this is a dramatized kind of situation. Yeah, it, it really, it really that, is a drama in anything but name. And, it, and so. it's and it's and it's and they're just fun to read. At least some of them are, like the symposium, right? Um, and so, and I'm partial to the Phaedrus myself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and so was Julian. Trust me. Uh, so Plato's dialogues were taught, you know, as literary models, but. Also, you know, they were also had various moral, moral philosophy. The moral philosophy of it was also, you know, very appealing. And of course, Platonic philosophy and Christianity certainly found ways to, uh, to reconcile them uh, with each other. He becomes more interested in Platonic philosophy and he starts seeking out teachers of, of Platonism. And at this point we call it, it, we, the Platonism is Neoplatonism, right? So there's really kind of two branches of Neoplatonism that are kind of coexisting and sort of uh, at, at this time. And one is the kind of the original Platinian Porphyrian kind of school where it emphasizes kind of individual rational contemplation on the ability and kind of one's inherent div divinity and the ability of somebody through dialectical reasoning and contemplation and purification to uh, ascend and uh, reconnect with the, the higher principles and eventually achieve kind of union with the highest principle of the one. Types of philosophers, these kind of the scene school, you know, they see kind of traditional religion as as useful and good for its sort of instrumental kind of functions, its utilitarian functions, if you will. Um, but they themselves kind of understand the world working kind of more in terms of, you know, Platonist rationalist metaphysics, right? While Pl the Platonian Porphyrian school sort of has kind of a mysticism and sort of a spiritual kind of bent to it much more than say traditional platonism um you know they are not going so far as to kind of unify philosophy and religion until you get iamblichus of calchas coming along okay who is probably a student of porphyry who was a student of plotinus okay and um 
it's with the Iamblichian school that you see much more of a tendency towards a synthesis with uh, traditional pagan religion. And the reason for that is it has to do with this thing called this uh, theory of the descent of the descended soul. Right? So for somebody like Plotinus in that school, you have a rational soul and you have an ira irrational soul. Okay? There's parts of the soul. Okay. Um, and Plotinus thought that while our lower irrational souls are kind of engaged with this material world, right, our rational souls, kind of the divine element within us, is actually always up in the world of forms, if you will, up in the, in the immaterial world, okay, and that we're sort of, we're connected to it, and kind of the idea is to identify with that higher form of the soul more and more to the right. point where that's all we become and we unite with the first principle. That explains why a Platinian Neoplatonist sees uh, themselves as the at least theoretically capable of achieving personal salvation through the practice of, you know, theoretical philosophy. Iamblichus comes along and says, no, the entire human soul descends okay, from the gods and it, you know our rational soul our irrational soul all together descends entirely okay? it's all you know begins you know kind of trapped in embodiment in this material world okay? a result of that is iamblichus thought that the human soul a human being by themselves is actually incapable of achieving salvation and ascending back to the gods uh, by themselves, by their own efforts. Philosophy, at least traditional rational philosophy, is not enough. You need religion. Okay? You need the gods to help you reascend to them. Okay? Because the gods, God <laughs> exactly, the gods are so transcendent of this realm. A, that they just do not come into contact with this realm by any by any stretch okay and so and we are so separated from the realm of the gods to the point where in order for the gods to have any influence on this realm which of course they control this realm entirely but the but they don't contact it directly there's actually there's a hierarchy of uh, inferior divinities diamonds the the daimones the the heroes the pure souls the angels right there's this hierarchy of superior beings that are superior to human beings to human souls but they are inferior to the gods and these is and this is sort of this chain of being right uh the gods influence their kind of their illumination their power is kind of filtered down through them but also this chain of superior beings is also the latter right, by which the human soul can ascend. However, in order to achieve that ascent, yes, practicing philosophy, purifying oneself morally is important and necessary. However, that's only sort of a preparatory practice. You actually need to uh, engage in various forms of ritual okay, that the gods had prescribed okay, by communicating through the ancients, right? The ancient oracles, if you will, the Chaldean oracles are sort of a later version of, of that sort of divine communication, right? Through various prophets, through various oracle sites, etc. Right. Ancient oracles essentially prescribed forms of ritual practice, okay, that someone who has purified themselves can engage in, in order to achieve that salvation, to lift their soul up to uh, communion with the gods, okay? And whereas the Platinians would think of this kind of ascent and return to the gods as a form of divinization, right? You actually literally <laughs> fuse with the first principle and become God yourself, okay? And I am a you know, human soul, regardless of how much it ascends and purifies itself, it always stays a human soul ontologically it never actually becomes a god it can't 
okay, ontologically. Right. It doesn't right? get fused However, with the one or anything. It doesn't get fused, but it can come into communion with, right? Um, and contemplate the higher higher being. And that's that's about as good as you can get, okay? Is how an Iamblichian would call divinization, right? To be a theos on air is someone who is capable of, through the practice of these ritual acts, to uh, ascend that far. And so those ritual acts um, are theurgy. Okay? And the thing about theurgy is you tend to think of theurgy as like, oh, the Chaldean oracles prescribe this sort of um, practices that are completely different than anything you've seen in religion. Uh, and while, yes, there's some special practices that like the higher theurgists and the adepts kind of practice, uh, you can really think of any sort of religious ritual that involves prayer, sacrifice, and anything that that requires contact with the gods, you know, uh, as a form of theurgy, like maybe a lower right. form of theurgy. Okay. Right. Um, so not everybody, not everybody is animating statues, but it, yeah. people can pray, people can meditate, do things like exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. And the point of theurgy, as you mentioned, I think is it is theos, God, ergon, work, God activity. It's divine activity. In other words, by practicing theurgy, you are assimilating yourself to the gods or imitating the gods in some way by participating in their activity. You're becoming more godlike by doing the things that uh, the gods do. Okay? Um, and so this is how Iamblichus and his school and Julian after him are able to see how to provide a Neoplatonic as they see it, rational framework in which all traditional religion makes sense theoretically. Okay? Because every traditional religion came into being through oracles that communicated from whatever particular god uh, was, in was in charge in that particular place, told them how to, how to conduct worship. Right? Julian is not trying to impose a single religion or catechism or doctrine, okay? He simply subscribes to a philosophical school that sees all traditional religion as essentially doing the same thing. You know, all of these gods that they worship are essentially emanations of the higher God, you know, that is, you know, the one intellect, one being, you know, descending from there. I guess in philosophical terms, it's almost like a perennialist Mm -hmm. kind of view of religion and theology and things like mm -hmm. that it's a uh, they take the stoic kind of allegorical method that you have in cornutus mm -hmm. and then they kind of take it to their yep. own and they apply that towards religions and mm -hmm. and um you know you find that in philo and the middle platonic stuff but then yeah it really gets going with mm -hmm. um plotinus and porphyry yep. so so like yeah like you yeah. said there's two different <laughs> groups and i don't think i'd ever see porphyry animate a statue but you know uh, yeah. yamblicus certainly would and and um yep. the people who follow in his footsteps they certainly would and they're looking at that um mm -hmm. you mentioned the theos honor you know uh, of course the paradigm for that divine holy mm -hmm. man is of course apollonius of tiana yep. who julian seeing all this stuff and these are basically like the rock stars the, ro the rock stars of his day right he's like yep. i i want to animate statues like maximus or whatever <laughs> so, yeah so uh i love i love that you know it's like uh what he's doing uh you know with his social and religious forms i i kind of uh liken it to like when he gets in charge he's almost like an, an oil tycoon and he goes and makes this like all-star basketball team of platonic philosophers and things like that and he just like brings them all over and yep. like he surrounds himself with his entourage uh, mm -hmm. i really love that um, I think it, like he's like a crunk rapper with all his like entourage of like really smart dudes who are like animating statues and trying to fend off earthquakes and stuff. I, I just love it. Um, Dr. Swiss, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an absolute pleasure. We hope to have you again sometime. You have an amazing evening. Thank uh, you. You too. Thank you.